Hello and welcome to a special interview with The Wire supported by Glenn David Books. Now we all know that the February 2019 Pulwama terrorist attack was a turning point for the country. But was the way the intelligence agencies cracked the attack a second turning point? That's certainly the message of a book that's published this week and here it is. It's called The Lover Boy of Bahawalpur. In a moment I'll explain to you that intriguing and beguiling title. The author is Rahul Pandita and he's my guest today. Rahul, your book tells the incredible, some would say almost unbelievable story of how the Pulwama terrorist attack was cracked. But before I come to that, I want to quote from the author's note at the end of the book. You write, I have relied upon officers of the NIA and JK police who were directly involved in the investigation. At every stage, the events described in the book were corroborated at multiple levels with other agencies involved in counterinsurgency in and outside Kashmir. These include sources in the Indian Army, CRPF, BSF, Delhi Special Police Cell and RAW. Tell me, was it difficult to get these people to talk? Because normally they don't speak to the media. Or once they started, did you find you'd won their trust and they were eager to spill the beans? It was very difficult at first, Karan. Because, uh, and some of the investigators involved in the investigation are old friends. Uh, but they are also professional investigators and when they were investigating, they were keeping their cards very close to their chest. It is only towards the end of the investigation when the, all the dots were connected uh, and the evidence, some of it was produced in the court and the mastermind had been identified, etc. is when they started sharing this story in bits and pieces. After a while, I found that they're also very keen to tell this story because, you know, when they're investigating, they're going through a, a varied, varied set of emotions. Uh, so the trickle then became a storm towards the end and I was able to put the story together. And the whole thing hinged upon your winning their trust. The second they felt Rahul is someone we can trust, they began to tell you more and more and more. Yes. Let's then at this point come to two amazing stories in your book, which I have to tell you, absolutely stunned me as I read them. The first is how Rakesh Balwal, the head of the National Investigative Agency in Srinagar, accidentally stumbled upon evidence that established that Adil Dar was the terrorist who perpetrated the Pulwama attack. It happened just six days after the attack. He was walking around the area when he looked down and he suddenly saw something shiny on the ground. Why did you complete that story for me? Uh, the suicide uh, bombers video is released 15 minutes after the attack, but the intelligence agencies are not sure. Uh, and this is, uh, this is at that time when Rakesh Balwal, the chief investigator of this case, decides to expand the area where they are searching. Uh, they, he leads a huge party of CRPF and NIA about 250-300 meters away from the site of the blast uh, in this place called Hajipura near the banks of Jhelum. And during this extended line search, when he is weighed off the uh, actual spot, he finds this uh, uh, key uh, in that muddy slush uh, and a piece of bone of the thumb. That kind of cracks the, uh, you know, the initial part of the investigation because the thumb is then sent to for a DNA anal analysis and it is confirmed that the suicide bomber is indeed Adil Amadar and, uh, and the car key 1026 belongs to the car which was used in the suicide attack. It seems to me there were two bits of luck here. He was walking around, there was mud and slush. If his eyes hadn't fallen on a key and a piece of bone, he might never have seen it. Yes, th that is how they say that uh, luck always uh, supports the, those who work hard. In this case, Rakesh Balwal uses his din diligence and intelligence to extend his search and luck favours him. The other bit of luck is that this was six days after the terrorist attack had happened. Yes. And this is February. Yes. There might have been rain, there might have been uh, wind, there might have been snow. If the key or the piece of bone had been washed away or blown away, we'd never have made the connection to either Adil Dar or the Echo Ka. The connection would have been difficult or it would have taken a much, much longer time. So in a sense, this is fortuitous accident. This is pure good luck. Yes. The second story, and in a sense it's almost as amazing, is how again Rakesh Balwal, who was investigating on behalf of the NIA, discovered that the mastermind behind the Pulwama attack was none other than Omar Farooq, Masood Azhar, the head of the Jashim Muhammad's nephew. And this happened eight months after Pulwama, in October. 
He happened to be in Naugam police station looking at a photograph of two terrorists who had been killed in some completely different incident in March. And he became very curious about the clothes one of them was wearing. Once again, what happened next? By this time, the NIA investigation team is very frustrated because they've hit a dead end. Some minor players have died, uh, but there's nothing uh, which is coming to them beyond this. It is at that point in time, uh, Rakesh's team decides to um, investigate every other uh, encounter where Jash militants have uh, died. And he comes across uh, a picture of this encounter in which two terrorists have killed, have died. Uh, in the encounter and then he looks at this dead body which is very clean and the man, this young man who's wearing black overalls, he's wearing an Adidas t-shirt, Adidas shoes, black jeans, um, he looks well groomed. You know normally jazz terrorists are not a, as groomed and he somehow his gut feeling tells him that this man should be uh, someone very important. Of course, the police are not concentrating on him at all because for them, the other person who has uh, died along with him is very important. It is only after that when uh, that mobile phone goes to uh, the technical department, certain, etc. The mobile phone being the phone of the man wearing the Adidas yes. overalls yes. in the picture. Yes. And then when that phone is opened up, with technological expertise is when then the case begins to unravel. So again, if Rakesh Balwal hadn't seen this photograph and hadn't noticed that one of the two dead terrorists was wearing Adidas clothes, which he said are far too smart for terrorists to wear, his curiosity wouldn't have been aroused. Not at all. And if his curiosity hadn't been aroused, he wouldn't have bothered to check into this man's phone which was lying with the police. Absolutely. And in fact, even there, the checking into the phone didn't happen easily because the police had tried previously to check. They thought the phone was destroyed. They thought they couldn't go through it. And Rakesh Balwal made it possible to do just that. Yes, so, so that is a shortcoming of investigation as far as terrorist encounters are concerned in, uh, uh, in, in Kashmir. Sometimes the end goal of counterinsurgency model in Kashmir, and that is a problem as far as I'm concerned, is to, you know, you get a particular intelligence of two or three terrorists holed up in a building. You, uh, you kill them and that is the end of it. Then the investigation part is where you lack and that is where the NIS goes. And what Rakesh Balwal did was to take the phone of a terrorist who was killed in a separate encounter, become curious about the terrorist because the guy was wearing Adidas clothes, and say to his colleagues, I know he may have died in a different encounter, but I'm curious about this guy. Let's find a way of looking into his phone. And when they looked into his phone, things moved rapidly and they suddenly discovered this guy is Omar Farooq. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so the phone goes to certain and after a week, Rakesh Balwa receives a call and the words he hears on that mobile phone call is, Sir, we have hit a jackpot. And the people who were taking that phone apart, the first picture they access on that phone is the picture of the suicide bomber along with the mastermind Umar Farooq and another the dreaded terrorist uh, jester is called Hanjila Jihadi. They're together and there is this aluminium powder smeared on their faces. In fact, your publisher Chiki Sarkar tells me that this story about Rakesh Balwal, why he became curious about the terrorist, how he then looked into the phone, is only known to 14 people. So this is really top secret information, isn't it? It is. And there's a very interesting final twist to the Omar Farooq story. Omar Farooq had been told by his uncle, Rauf Asghar, destroy the phone. Yes. And Omar Farooq had lied and claimed he'd destroyed the phone, but he hadn't. And the reason he hadn't is because it contains pictures of his girlfriends. Is that right? Yes. And somehow he becomes fond of this phone. This phone is an expensive one and he has a lot of material data on that phone. He has pictures uh, of the Sangin camp in Helmand province of Afghanistan where he has uh, you know, undertaken a training course in the best facility run jointly by uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, uh, Jash. So he's very fond of that phone. When Rauf Asghar asks him to destroy the phone, uh, he lies to him. He destroys a other cheap phone and tells him that you know, he'll destroy the phone. But he's also using the same phone to be in touch with his girlfriend. Absolutely. That's the second twist. So the first bit of luck on our side was that this guy was obsessed by his phone. He liked it. He didn't destroy it. He lied to his uncle that he had. And the second bit of luck is that the phone contained pictures of his many girlfriends. 
And when those pictures were seen by one of his puritanical colleagues, a guy called Shakir Bashir, that man was so disillusioned, he went on to reveal that the name of the guy who owns the phone is Omar Farooq. Yes. So Shakir does not believe in it. Shakir is a part of Jash because he believes in the idea of jihad. He's very puritanical. Uh, he's, he's not like Umar Farooq in that sense. He cannot believe that someone like Umar Farooq, who is his commander in a sense, and comes to Kashmir Valley with a certain purpose, uh, can indulge in these extramarital, because he's already married, can indulge in this uh, womanizing. He just can't believe it. And I think that is the uh, moment when he becomes weak uh, and he misses his mother when he begins to divulge uh, details to the NIA investigators. So that's the point when Shakir Bashir, who till then had been tough and not speaking, got disillusioned with his commander, saw that his commander was actually having affairs with girls and decided to tell Balwal that this guy, whose picture you're seeing, whose phone's in your hands, is actually Omar Farooq. Yes, and the, the story after this is entirely based on Shakir Bashir's confession. If it were not for Shakir Bashir, uh, we would not have known many aspects of this investigation. And what turned the key to make Shakir Bashir talk, as you comment in your book, is Omar Farooq's lust. You actually say it was Omar Farooq's lust yes. that finally gave him away. Yes, he cannot believe it. Uh, and when uh, the uh, evidence is put in front of him, uh, Balwal makes him uh, listen to some of the audio conversations between uh, Inshar Jan, the woman in question, and other girlfriends, and Umar Farooq. It is then that he breaks uh, and starts to spill the beans. In fact, Omar Farooq is quite a guy, isn't he? Because his main girlfriend was someone called Inshar Jan. Right. But at the same time, he was also having an affair with Inshar Jan's cousin. Right. I mean, that's an incredible thing. It's almost like a Casanova. Yes, and you know, uh, uh, jazz terrorists are trained uh, in this maneuver. They are uh, ruthless manipulators. Uh, their, end, their end goal is to further their cause. So they use overground workers, uh, both men and women, uh, to further their end goal. But in this case, you know, he also gets close uh, to Inshan Jan and other women, which Inshan Jan is not aware of. And when the evidence of the fact that Umar Farooq is also involved with other women, including her own cousin, is when she also gets very disillusioned and then starts spilling the beans. And this is where the title of your book comes from. This is why you call it the lover boy of Bahawalpur, because yes. Bahawalpur in Pakistan yes. is where Umar Farooq comes from. Right. And lover boy is an allusion to the fact that this guy was having multiple affairs with women. Right. And the interesting thing, therefore, is this was a ruthless Jaish terrorist who organized one of the most brutal killings in India. Right. And yet what he couldn't do was stop himself falling in love with women and wanting sex with them. Absolutely. His lust, in a sense, literally, did him is away. what did him in. It gave him away. Yeah. Now, the other thing I noticed in your book, and it's very striking, are the photographs. One normally doesn't spend too much time looking at photographs in a book like this. It's the captivating stories that grab your attention. But you have photographs of Adil, the terrorist, with Umar Farooq. You have photographs of Insha Jan and Umar, and Insha Jan is his girlfriend. You have photographs of the famous Maruti car that was used. And you also have screenshots of Omar's conversations with his uncle Rauf Asghar, who's in fact his father's brother, Masood Asghar's brother. And as I looked at these photographs, I said to myself, these have to be taken by the terrorists themselves. Right. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. So these photographs are from the terrorists' phones. The same phone, yes. The very same phone? Yes. The phone that in fact cracked the story is the phone that took these photographs. Absolutely. This phone belongs to Umar Farooq and there's a lot of data in it which ultimately leads the NIA uh, to, to Jaish facility in Pakistan. So in addition to the incredible stories that your contacts in intelligence told you, they also gave you these photographs. Yes. And what is also incredible is that I got Ghazi Bawa's photo, who was the mastermind of the parliament attack and who was someone the security forces came a long way in 2003. And again, the, the, all of this was given to you by intelligence because by then, yes. they'd learned to trust you. Absolutely. I don't mean to be rude, but do you ever get the feeling that intelligence wanted you to write this book? That after they began to believe they trust you, they willingly told you more and more, shared their photographs, because this was a book that would present their side of the story, which otherwise would never have got out. So in a sense, do you think they wanted this story written? 
Yes, Karan, because, you know, if you if we look at Ghazi Baba story, when I was researching the Ghazi Baba story, for example, and I was looking at the archives, I was very surprised to see that there is very little written uh, in 2003 about that time. And when I spoke uh, to the officers uh, who killed, I found that there's a sort of bitterness in them about the fact that they did not give get due credit uh, for what they achieved in 2003 itself. You know, it's a time when the intelligence agency, agencies have lied to uh, the Home Minister saying that Ghazi Baba has already crossed over to Pakistan, but he's not. And then he gets caught in this encounter. So there was a lot of bitterness about the fact that uh, they have not gotten the uh, due credit and it is time that the story uh, reaches the masses. Uh, and that is how they opened up to me. Just to explain, Ghazi Baba, in fact, is the person who was the perpetrator and the main terrorist in the parliament attack that happened yes. in 2001. Yes. And that's part of your book, right. but it's not part of the Pulwama story. Right. It's a part of the book as a chapter on its own. Right. Right. But what you're saying is that the intelligence agents who had cracked the parliament attack story and established Ghazi Baba never got credit for the good work they did. There was frustration in their heart. And now when they'd won your trust, they said, this is an opportunity for us to tell someone who write sympathetically the story of the Pulwama attack. And as a result, their frustration led to your benefit because they told you a story hoping that they never got credit for one, but at least they'll get decent credit for the other. Absolutely. And, you know, the, some of these officers are also some uh, people who have followed my work for over a long period of time. So they knew you. Uh, and they know me and they know and because they are intelligent, they're educated. They know that I do not fall easily in the binaries of left and right. I like to report truthfully and that is how I want their trust. So would I be right in saying, and again, I'm using this word carefully, that this book is in a sense written cooperatively. I won't say collaboratively because that sounds like a nasty word, but cooperatively. They cooperated with you once you had won their trust. The book would not have been possible if the intelligence agencies and the investigators directly involved in these investigations and these encounters had not cooperated with me. And just for the sake of the audience, I'll repeat something I read out earlier that in fact everything in the book was corroborated at multiple levels with other agencies involved in counterinsurgency. Right. And those include agencies both in and outside. Right. So everything was not just told to you, yes. but double checked and triple checked. Absolutely, because you know, especially when you're talking about old incidents like Ghazi Baba's encounter in 2003, sometimes you know, memory can be a little slippery. So I have checked and corroborated uh, those every fact with multiple agencies who were involved. You know, for example, the special cell in Delhi police was involved um, uh, in the investigation of people like Noor Trali, you know, the dwarfish merchant of death who becomes a jazz recruit, etc. Um, they were involved in the investigation of Ghazi and Baba. And you checked with them as well? They che we, uh, fact, we, we, checked we checked with the with army, the CRPF, the BSF, the military Delhi intelligence police special cell, yes. and RAW, yes. and military yes. intelligence as well. Every fact is corroborated from multiple sources that is, so that there is no doubt uh, or there is no doubt in my mind about the authenticity of what I'm uh, so what about we're to saying to the audience is that this book the lover boy of Bahawalpur may contain stories that at first reading are incredible some might even consider them unbelievable but they've been a told to you by people in intelligence who know b they've been corroborated at multiple levels and c you've got two three different sources for everything you say yes then at this point, let me put to you one or two things that I find a little disconcerting. Right. On page 167, you write about Umar and Insha. Right. You say, Umar introduced Insha to his mother and sister in Pakistan on WhatsApp video calls. Once, you say, he even made her speak to his wife. In other words, he made his girlfriend speak to his wife. And I said to myself as I read this, Rahul Pandita never met Umar. He hasn't met Insha. He doesn't know Umar's family in Pakistan. So how do you know that Umar made his girlfriend speak to his wife or to his mother or to his sister? How do you know that? So two things. One, uh, the entire interrogation report of Insha Jan, uh, where she has uh, spoken almost on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, her, um, her relationship with Umar Farooq. And uh, some of the conversations which he had um, uh, while, where Insha Jan is also present and his wife Afira Bivi is also present, uh, he had recorded them uh, on his uh, mobile. Uh, and they were found uh, on th that phone? They, were, they were, found, were found on that phone and uh, I, I saw them myself. Ah, so A, some of the conversations that Umar had with his family, even some conversations where he made Insha his girlfriend speak to his wife. 
right. were recorded on the phone yes. and you heard them yourself. Yes. Also, the investigation record where Insha Jan is spoken to and she speaks her story. Have you seen that? Was that made available to you? Uh, sorry, say that again? The investigation record where yes. Insha Jan speaks yes. to the... Yes, yes. You've was, seen it? Yes, I have. So actually you've got two sources for this. Yes. One is the phone conversation right. and the other is the investigation record. Yes. Now, something else that I found amazing is you describe in fair detail what the terrorists did, not just hours before the February 14th terror attack, but perhaps even minutes before. You write, on the afternoon of 14th February, Shakir Bashir informed Umar Farooq that the convoy movements would begin shortly. At 2 p.m., Umar left the house to do a recce himself. Once he was back, he told Shakir and Adil to leave immediately. Adil took a pistol along in case the IED did not detonate. And again, the question in my mind as I read it is, how on earth does Rahul know all of this? You weren't there. So this is again based on a very exhaustive investigation, interrogation uh, of, of Shakir Bashir, where he's taken... So Shakir said all of this? Yes. And then towards the end of it, uh, because, you know, I, I say in the beginning that the investigation is done very professionally by, by NIA. And the NIA, when after he spills the bean, the NIA takes him to his house along with the magistrate, as, is, uh, as it is supposed to be. Uh, and the whole evidence is corroborated. And all of this, again, is part of the investigation records. And again, you've seen these records with your eyes. Absolutely. So, once again, this is not Rahul Pandita using fiction to make a book colourful. This is actual fact based on the investigation record. This is absolutely factual, sentence to sentence, fact to fact, based on the investigation of the National Investigation Agency. The third thing is many of the conversations are actually in quotation marks. For instance, there are two between Umar Farooq and his uncle Rouse Asghar talking about more strikes that they plan after Pulwama as well as cancelling them. Now, how do you justify using quotation marks? Because I've heard these conversations that are again recorded on the same phone. Um, uh, this is a, a point where some of my uh, sources may get a little antsy, but I must say that uh, Wherever I have used quotes, uh, these are actual conversations happening between Rauf Azgar and Umar Farooq. And, and I've just quoted from those conversations. And you've actually heard I those conversations? I have heard them and I've quoted exactly from those conversations. So this suggests to me that that phone, which was actually discovered by accident, was critical because many conversations were recorded by Umar retained in the phone and once they cracked the phone they found the conversation let me put it this way the phone will form the backbone of evidence uh, in this case uh, as a professional investigation the nia know that it would have been very difficult to establish this case without the possession of what they found in this phone there's something else that's also very true and apparent not only is the phone absolutely critical and as you say the backbone but i don't think I've ever read an account by any author or a journalist of how the intelligence cracked a terror case that has so much inside detail given by the intelligence to him. I don't think anyone has ever had the sort of access you've got. It's incredible. How, I mean, you, you, it's so incredible that it's almost hard to believe. And I'm not being disbelieving, but you've got amazing cooperation. It only happens because you establish a trust for years and years. And uh, some of the officers involved in the investigation also know that I'm not a journalist who will believe in things blindly. And, you know, sometimes uh, intelligence agencies here and there like to plant uh, things from their point of view. They, they know from years of experience with they me. They trust you. They trust me. And they also know that I will not take their bullshit, uh, you know, just like that. You know, I will corroborate. I, I'll, like I'll, I'll use a lot of evidence. I completely believe everything I've read in the book. I accept that you've been told this, you had incredible access, you've heard the conversations, you've seen the intelligence record, you've seen the investigation record, things have been shared with you. There'll be many others who read the book and say, he's making it up, he's exaggerating, these are lies, this is perhaps fiction told to him which he's been gullible enough to accept. In other words, there'll be multiple reasons why people will doubt the veracity. Somebody even thinks that you're being used by the intelligence. 
How would you respond? I, I wouldn't blame them partially because, you know, if as an outsider, if I had seen, a, say, a Netflix series based on these facts, on the life of Ghazi Baba, and sometimes they say, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. Even for someone like me who has, uh, you know, who, who has been a counterinsurgency reporter for years, um, you know, I find some of it very difficult to believe. But every word, like I said, is corroborated from multiple sources. Uh, and there is not a, even a single fragment of untruth in this you story. You use the right analogy. Many will say to themselves, this has the makings of a Netflix story. So large is the element of the incredible as you read it. Right. So large is the element of good luck, which happens just at the right point, leading to just the right result. Right. It doesn't worry you that people will say this is just too good to be true. <laughs> well, it can happen. Uh, but uh, through this interview, I assured them that every sentence, every fact uh, in this story, I reiterate, has been checked and rechecked from multiple sources. So they have nothing to worry about. One more issue, and this time it's not about Pulwama, but it's about how Omar Farooq got caught in an encounter in March 2019. You write, it was just one small mistake Omar Farooq committed that led to the encounter. But what was that mistake? The investigators requested for that not to be made public. Had Omar not made that one mistake, Kamran and he would have gone unnoticed, planning other attacks on security forces. The security agencies wouldn't have even known of their existence. What is that critical mistake that you can't reveal? It's a, it's a tough call, you know, in uh, this little uh, segment of that investigation and how uh, they were dragged there, uh, was shared uh, with me by a top investigator of uh, the Jammu and Kashmir police and I was requested uh, that this be uh, not made public because they use the same tactics to uh, carry out other in investigations, the intelligence operations and it will help uh, the jazz terrorists, so I chose not to. So uh, this was one instance right. where one of your sources told you the story but at the same time also said, ye aage mat batana. Yes, a couple of other things which I have not made, you know, which I thought were beyond, be beyond the purview of this story. So, I have uh, chosen not so to write about that. So, there are more things you know which you haven't revealed. Yes, about uh, Balakot, for example, about Ghazi Baba, for example, about uh, what was happening days before uh, the suicide bombing. Is there a bombing. sequel in your mind? Will these other things, particularly about Balakot, there are a few hints about Balakot in the book, but I'm deliberately not taking them up because there are barely two or three sentences on that. Right. But is there a sequel in your mind? Could you write a second book that tells us the inside story of Balakot? Perhaps. Uh, Perhaps. Yes. So that's a possibility. It is a possibility, yes. My last question. In an op-ed that you wrote for the Hindustan Times yesterday, you said that the handling of the Pulwama case represents a sort of sea change for intelligence agencies. You say, prior to Pulwama, their dossiers looked like Wikipedia entries. Pulwama was the first solid evidence-backed investigation. Yes. So I, I let, me, let me pause there and put this to you. The problem is, so much of Pulwama was dependent upon good luck. Good luck that he happened to look down and see a key and a piece of bone from a thumb. Good luck it hadn't been washed away with the wind over the last six days. Good luck that he looked at a picture of two terrorists and said, this guy's dressed too smartly. Good luck that the Umar Farooq hadn't damaged his own phone, he damaged someone else's and lied. Good luck that the conversations were still retained. Does all of that really suggest a sea change in the way our intelligence agencies operate and therefore a new chapter? Or is it just good luck and nothing more? What I meant from this is, of course, you know, there are a few lucky strikes. But we must also remember that these lucky strikes are also possible because the investigators have used their brain uh, beyond the purview of, you know, how... Use they know, their brain or their curiosity or are the two the same? Are they, they're two essentially the same when it comes to investigating a particular encounter or particular case. Um, and, you know, it is because only because of their hard work and intelligence that they get these lucky strikes. And I say this because, you know, after 2008... Luck favours the brave. Luck favours the hard working. Hard working, yes. And you believe luck is not the important thing. The important thing is this time they were diligent, they were meticulous and they used their brain. Luck just favoured them. Favoured them, absolutely. Rahul Pandita, it's an incredible book. I'll hold it up once more for the audience to see. I'll say a lot of people will disbelieve it, but then people often do disbelieve things. 
On the other hand, as you said, everything in this book has been corroborated not once but two or three times. Great work. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you, Karan.